morning, everybody. Welcome, especially to our YouTube audience. Delighted to have you watching in today. We have an auditorium with some patients here, and we have patients on our live stream also. Today is February 21st, the year 2021, and the Karen Chapel service on the first Sunday of Lent, as it happens to be, um, explores the idea of suffering. Aren't you excited? Yay! Um, In my early recovery, there was a book that was very popular at the, at the time. I just looked and apparently the book was published in 1978. I didn't begin my recovery until a bit after that. But uh, anyway, I remember when I was in therapy, I read this book. It was by an uh, author named M. Scott Peck. And the book was called The Road Less Traveled, a reference to a frost poem. Um, but anyway, one of the things that was noted often about the book was that its first sentence, three words, was um, part of perhaps its cachet. Um, the, the opening sentence of the book, The Road Less Traveled, is the three-word sentence, Life is Difficult. So, I, I get to speak at Karen where the peculiar or particular angle on the difficulty of life is its intersection with the phenomenon of addiction. And addiction is difficult. No question. I think probably everyone listening to this message will agree and may even immediately think about the ways in which they have seen addiction as difficult. Uh, difficult for the sufferer of addiction, addiction difficult for those who are proximal to the suffering of addiction, uh, addiction is difficult for the society within which the addiction unfolds. It's just addiction is difficult. I was moved uh, this week as I was thinking about this topic to bring a tool to the question of suffering that is one I use all the time, but which probably the patient community and our listening community on YouTube would not necessarily be aware of. But there's a six-dimensional tool of interpretation that is used by the American Society of Addiction Medicine to look at an addiction client. And uh, I think it's helpful in this purpose because what I want to do is I want to use the tool immediately to think about how addiction suffering could be viewed through this six-dimensional framework. And then I want to talk about how wisdom in ancient tradition speaks into the space of suffering. And then I want to use the six-dimensional framework again to talk about the path forward. And to get to the punchline, I do not by any means, I think I like to paint recovery as awesome. I think it is awesome, but it's not an end to suffering. Uh, Recovery invites us to exchange one world of suffering for another world of suffering. Sorry. Um, but uh, that's a, I, I feel a, a complete obligation to be truthful, especially when I put the stole on. And so I, uh, I can't tell you that it's going to be easy and no problem and you're just going to be fine. Uh, but I can tell you that I would rather have the suffering of my recovery than the suffering of my addiction. So let me illuminate that with this little idea of the six dimensions of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. The speaking into that suffering of wisdom traditions and then the journey forward for those of you who will embark with me. Uh, we did Ash Wednesday here for those who uh, are in the Christian traditions and so we're on this uh, brief journey headed towards an Easter. And you can think of that metaphorically, too. And if Christianity is not your thing, totally good with that. We're, we're kind of a Baskin-Robbins. All flavors are fine uh, in terms of spiritual uh, belief, including uh, flavorlessness, as, which, is, which would be demeaning. So even a non-religious or non-affiliated uh, perspective, I think this, this, this message is for anyone. It's a human issue. So the first way that I was trained as a clinician to look at an addiction client was in terms of intoxication withdrawal, but especially withdrawal. How hard is it for us to tear them away from their unhealthy attachment to substances or behaviors or relationships that are toxic to them? 
So that's when we talk about detoxification and then the withdrawal and post-acute withdrawal. So um, that's part of the suffering of the care and patient. It's really, really not fun. And one of the reasons why rehabs like Karen extend an invitation to you to a minimum of 28 days is because even after two, three, four, five days or two weeks, benzodiazepines, I'm gonna call it three weeks. You now opioids, it's, it's a, this withdrawal experience is quite miserable for many of us for quite an extended period. The second dimension of the suffering of uh, a medical assessment is biomedical. So it's, um, I would call it, a, uh, I'm going to use the word affliction. Does, does the person who is being helped to withdraw from the substances also suffer from chronic pain? Do they have pancreatitis? Do they have arthritis? Do they have um, heart di disease? Do they have things which may require them to seek medical care as they continue in recovery? And will Medicare have to, medical care have to be different because certain medications are no longer uh, available as at least the chronic care medications for people in recovery. So, um, for example, for me, I have certain chronic pain issues. I don't want to tell you what they are, but I use NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, rather than opioids because um, pretty much every day I have pain. Uh, third lens of suffering for the medical professional assessing a person in addiction is what I would call in my spiritual take on these six angst. What is the emotional, cognitive, and behavioral? That's how the psychologists and the medical people call it, but I'm gonna call it the angst, the like soulful, emotional of it. And um, this could be identified by the psychologist with terms and diagnoses that they are trained to classify and identify like anxiety, depression, uh, bereavement, um, uh, which is a fancy word for grief, trauma. Um, those, those four are the principal ones that we find here in the largest majority among our clients. And so probably many of you in listening on this would go, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, and don't raise your hands. But I, you know, oh, that, that's part of my story. And that's part of the suffering that maybe addiction is reinforced by, that underlies as you seek to get clean and sober, there may be a, a one of the things that the clinicians often say in team meetings is that we see anxiety and depression in this patient, but we don't know yet if that's because they've been taking a depressant and they're stressed out about the drug life. Like, so will recovery alleviate some of that or not? Maybe not all, like some, there, are, there are those among us who will stay challenged in the angst area even off the substances and behaviors. So, um, fourth dimension is, um, for me, I'm gonna say apathy. The clinicians say motivation. But I think um, there is a resignation that the addict in their addiction feels like, I don't even know why I should bother to try and stop because there's a hopelessness that attaches to a feeling of inevitability. Like, I'm just going to go back to using, so. Uh, see, it doesn't, it doesn't recovery sound fun in this perspective? It's like, oh, yeah, I'm not quite done yet. The fifth way that the medical and clinical professionals look at the addiction client is in terms of specific risk factors, which may actually have come up from the first four or being the sixth. But in any case, it's like, what is going to be especially hard for you? And I don't know what that is, but most of us have a certain one or two things that are like, yeah. Um, uh, I don't think I could ever stop using because. That, that would be one way of answering for you. What is your dimension five issues? Is I'm pretty sure I won't be able to stay stopped because. Uh, those, are the, those are ways I understand what it is. And um, it's important if you're here to sort of think about honestly what is difficult. The last one of the six is isolation. So if you want to allow me to review, it's uh, withdrawal, um, affliction, angst, apathy, risk, and isolation. 
Those are the characteristics of addiction suffering according to this particular frame of reference. And I think it's quite a, a, a helpful frame of reference because it's meant to be comprehensive and holistic. I know one of the people who helped develop this model, his name is Dr. David E. Lee, and that was his intention, was to provide the, the addiction medicine clinician with a way of looking at the person in their entirety. And so if you feel like as I touch lights and buttons, a lot of it is relevant to you, then that's a tribute to David Mealy and his team. And, and that's because it was meant to be. It's meant to cover a lot of the different ways in which it, excuse me for the vernacular, sucks to be you. Um, that's, and that is the truth. I mean, it's no fun. It's not fun to have your life interrupted and, and, and be brought here by an interventionist or on the tail ends of an intervention process at home or because the government is after you or because, you know, uh, you, you were drunk on the job or you didn't show up at school or, you know, whatever it is, it's no fun. Into the realities of suffering, in every context in all of human history, Wisdom speaks, Buddhism speaks, Judaism speaks, Native American traditions speak, Christianity speaks. The, the, this is one of the functions of the sacred traditions of the world, is to speak within community about how we interpret death and struggle and, 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 and seek to navigate the truth that Scott Peck put his finger on with the three word, life is difficult, summation. So I was going to touch on a couple of those traditions. One of them, I'm going to start with is Hinduism, which I am a dilettante in looking at. But I was reminded as I went to review that Hinduism is where mindfulness really truly finds its first basis. Many people say, oh, mindfulness comes out of Buddhism, which it certainly does, but Buddhism comes out of Hinduism. So, the, the parent tradition of mindfulness really probably, you should say, is Hinduism. Because Hindu practices include mindful meditation. And the idea of acceptance is an essential one in Hindu uh, interpretation. And acceptance of what? Well, acceptance of suffering. Like that's, a, that's a part of where wisdom speaks, is that um, Hinduism would tell us we will, suffering will be with us and we will continue to experience it. And then it offers us different ways of responding to it. Um, I think one of the things that I've noticed in my study of Buddhism is that Buddhism um, offers two very specific points of emphasis within its tradition about suffering. Actually, it's a whole, Buddhism is in, in some way all about suffering. But, and I say Buddhism as if it's one thing, there are many expressions of Buddhism. But anyway, at the core of the Buddhist teachings are uh, practices about compassion and forgiveness, which I think are often surprising to people, because I think that many people misunderstand Buddhism and think it's kind of, I don't know, ethereal and distancing and get, you know, clearing the mind or whatever. So when, then you start learning about Buddhist practice, you find out, no, I'm, I'm supposed to meditate on compassion, I'm supposed to meditate on forgiveness, and I think about it, people I have difficulty forgiving and I seek to pray for the ability to someday get to the point of forgiveness of them. It's like very concrete and real. Buddhism is very much grounded in the presence of suffering and in the struggle to navigate life with the reality of suffering. Um, Judaism is another fun stopping place on the map of the world's traditions with regards to suffering because Judaism also is like raw and real when suffering um, is in play. I, I learned uh, from my Hebrew teacher about the Deuteronomistic cycle, which is the story in the Hebrew Bible, if you're a Christian, what was, would be called the Old Testament, of the constant striving of the human persons to get back on the right side of their relationship with the divine, and their constant sort of failure. And so it's just like, you know, messy, and then getting better, and then messy, and then getting better. And, Nothing get better. But the persistence of the idea of repentance, of turning back again and again, um, and uh, that's part of what wisdom does speak in the moment of the topic at hand. And then with Lent beginning this week, um, I suspect that um, usually somewhere around a third of the Karen audience would identify itself as in some way related to the Christian traditions, Catholic, Protestant, non-denominational, 
Jehovah's Witness, you know, a variety of Mormons, various different flavors within and around the long, big umbrella tent, which is the Christian um, set of um, communities. And some of those take the period from Wednesday just past to Easter and, um, and spend some time really reflecting on the story of Jesus as the divine entering into human suffering. So this idea and Christmas expressed of God with us like becomes very real as the character Jesus is beaten and tormented and rejected and, and sees the reality. And then in some ways this is God present to suffering, which is a, a dramatically interesting take on the idea of of this. I, um, I was trying to remember the name of this movie. You all will know it. I, I think the honestly Jim Carrey's in it, but it's anyway, it's a movie about uh, a silly character who gets a day to be God. And Almighty Bruce? Al Almighty, Bruce Almighty. Bruce Almighty. <laughs> Bruce Almighty. And, and part of the hilarity of it is the overwhelming burden of the divine awareness. Which I don't know that any of, I mean, I don't think I ever really thought about that in my little Sunday school preparation. I didn't ever think, oh my gosh, like, if God is really listening in and really feels suffering, how hard it would be to be that aware of, the scriptures say that God hears the cries of God's people. So one of the funny things in Lent and in many of the spiritual traditions of the world is this idea of, of fasting. And it's not a popular topic anymore, fasting, unless we're doing it like a juice fast for, you know, purity cleansing or, uh, you know, getting ready for the wrestling match and I need to get down my one weight class or whatever. Like, I think the Western American world has lost the noble dignity of spiritual fast as a practice. But in antiquity, there were many, many people who practiced fasting. And when I was in seminary, I practiced a 23-hour fast every Thursday night into Friday. After dinner Thursday, I would not eat again until Friday supper. Um, partly inspired by a reading that you're going to hear later this morning uh, from a writer named Richard Foster. And when I was in seminary, I'd gone from being an atheist to exploring spiritual traditions. You can tell I'm still interested in the variety of the world's traditions. But I, I, um, I went to a Christian seminary and I was learning about Christianity. And when I started learning about Christian fasting practices, including that fasting practice in Lent, it, like one day it was like, oh my God, I'm on a perpetual alcohol fast. And I have to tell you, it really was like really helpful for me to think about my recovery as a practice that stands in this historic lineage. And that the Hindu practice of fasting or the uh, you know, Native American practice of fasting or the Christian practices of fasting in, in history and the, and the other wisdom traditions, there, there was this idea that in going without, you would experience a certain kind of suffering for good reason. Like that the suffering that you experience in fasting has purposes. For Richard Foster, the key two purposes of suffering are empathy with those who do suffer, others, so you understand suffering better when you, and I will tell you, my Friday afternoon fast in seminary, I would tell people like at the beginning of like a class or a discussion or lunch or whatever, I would even go to people with lunch, but I, I got really crabby. And I've come to realize that when people are crabby, it might be because they're like feeling deprived and not just because they're crabby people. So it gave me insight into the experience of suffering of others. And also in the Bruce Almighty sense, it gives me insight into the divine. Like what would it be like for the religious traditions of the world which speak into the idea of God or the divine to be attuned to suffering on a global and indeed cosmic scale. And I'm like, I don't know if I can even handle that, but 
But my recovery does that for me. My recovery does give me an opportunity to have empathy for others and an opportunity to have maybe just a glimmer of insight into what it would be to be, um, to be aware that the world is in suffering, essentially all the time. So I need to finish up, but I, I would say that if you took all of the different dimensions of the ASAM criteria and thought about your recovery, which I hope you're going to begin, as a journey out of one kind of suffering and into another way of experiencing suffering, then the withdrawal is, its, it's, it's next chapter is finding home. Like finding where you will be, where you connect. Because you're disconnecting from alcohol, but it gives you a chance to be grounded in the real world. Life on life's terms. That's like, so presence uh, is the antithesis of withdrawal. And, you know, when people withdraw from you, they're away. And then, and then showing up is part of what it is. So that's like a beautiful invitation to really be present. Also, instead of seeing yourself as afflicted by chronic pain or whatever, it's to begin to see yourself as whole. And that's a challenge for me. With my chronic pain condition, I often think like my creaky bones and all that stuff. I'm like, I feel deficient, but, but on a good day, I feel this sense of wholeness and renewal. Uh, the other day I ran a 5K and I, and I felt so exuberant that I could do it. And, and in my recovery, I find an imperfect wholeness rather than pure painless state in my biomedical state. I also, I remember I had a sponsor once who years ago used to, every, every anniversary gave me the same card. I guess he had a box of them and he thought I needed it. So the card would say, serenity is not the absence of conflict, but the ability to be at peace in the midst of it. And, and that's to me the offer of recovery is this opportunity not to be out of suffering, but to be able to be at a certain kind of peace with the reality of suffering around us. Instead of apathy and indifference and despair and hopelessness, to find motivation, to find stuff to live for, to stay sober for, and to dream or pursue your passions or whatever. For me today, that's much more family than it was the career advancement of 10 years ago. Um, I don't know what it is for you. And um, out of the risk concerns of the fifth dimension, I get to know what, where I, what, what makes me safe. And a big part of that for me is, is family and community. So I can't promise you an end to suffering, but I would, would invite you, especially our current patients and those who are listening on YouTube and have experienced the idea of recovery, even as family members, we had that chance to, to join in an unfolding and continuous fast from unhealthy behaviors, one day at a time. Today I will not drink. Today I will not gamble. Today I will not shop if I don't, if it's not for a necessity, not like for the for the high of the one quick Amazon thing. Today I will not, you know, engage in electronic devices for unhealthy purposes. Like those. There's a variety of ways that people practice recovery. It starts off in a camera with the drinking and the drugs, but it can get bigger and bigger and bigger. And for the family member, it would be like, today I will not try to control another person's life. You know, uh, today I will, I will stand on my own square, and I will be in relationship, and I will experience my suffering and be sensitive to the suffering of others. And I can do that one day. I can do that for 23 hours. I can do it for... 22 hours, 20 hours, 21. I can actually maybe push it to 24. And then the next 24, I just try again. So, I'm happy to welcome you to the community of the Perpetual Alcohol Fast. And, um, it's not an end to suffering, but it's an exchange. A much better way of experiencing suffering than we did before.